All right. Welcome back, everyone. We'll um, go ahead and start on uh, module two, which is going to talk about post-combustion capture and post-combustion uh, cleanup of uh, pollutants is, uh, uh, I guess, a very traditional thing in, in, in for combustion. You know, at a power plant, uh, you have uh, bag houses to take care of particulates. Um, you have uh, processes to take care of the SO2 for the NOx. Uh, all of those are end of pipe type of uh, uh, processes. And so in post-combustion capture, we're looking at end of pipe processes um, to take care of the CO2. Uh, the next module will look at a little more uh, uh, intricate processes that uh, try to integrate the two together. But um, in terms of um, the history uh, the patent for uh, what is uh, post-combustion CO2 capture goes back to 1930, a patent by R.R. Uh, Bottoms, and that mainly was used over the years uh, to clean up acid gases from industrial processes, uh, especially uh, natural gas processing, uh, maybe some things at refineries. And that was all used um, on... Uh, it's basically a chemical scrubbing that was used on um, gases that were reduced. So uh, your acid gases um, are in a reducing atmosphere. So there wasn't oxygen in, in the stream. So, you know, you have your, your sulfur was in the form of H2S. You had CO2, but you didn't have uh, very much of any oxygen in there. In 1978, uh, in California at the Trona plants, it was the first time um, chemical scrubbing, specifically amines, were applied uh, to flue gases. And flue gases are basically an oxidizing um, atmosphere. And um, so, uh, because they're coming off of uh, combustion processes. Uh, the problem with oxidizing atmospheres and amines is oxygen uh, degrades the amines, it causes corrosion. So uh, the type of amines they had to use, they had to have a lot of additives uh, to prevent corrosion, uh, to prevent degradation, and that was successfully done uh, uh, in 1978. In the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of small-scale capture from flue gases. Uh, there were basically two vendors, uh, Floor and uh, Lummis, which was part of uh, ABB. Um, Floor was mainly for uh, gas streams. Lummis could actually be used on a, on a coal process. It was, uh, well, the, the process used at the Trona plant was uh, the same process that uh, Lummis, Lummis had licensed. Um, what drove this? Uh, in the uh, 1980s, there were the oil shocks. Uh, people thought we were running out of oil. Uh, the price skyrocketed, uh, and they wanted uh, CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. So several plants were built in, the, um, in uh, West Texas and in uh, New Mexico uh, to capture CO2 to help uh, drive uh, to help uh, provide CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, PURPA is the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act. Uh, uh, and when that came out, it um, was encouraging cogeneration. And uh, uh, there was a term called PURPA machines. And what a PURPA machine was, was something that took advantage of the PURPA regulation, which says you can get extra money for your electricity if you were a co-generator. Uh, well, post-combustion capture needs steam from the power plant. So if they put ca post-combustion capture on a small uh, slipstream of the power plant and had enough uh, steam use, which is 5% of the steam of the uh, power plant, they could qualify and get extra money for their um, electricity sold, and also, of course, uh, can sell the CO2 into commercial markets. Uh, so there were, I think, three plants built uh, because of PURPA, uh, and, and once again, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and um, starting in about 1982, we started seeing large-scale capture for EOR, 
Um, this included from natural gas processing, from fertilizer plants, and also from a coal gasification plant up in uh, North Dakota. And basically the CO2 here was free. Uh, the processes were already capturing the CO2. It was coming out pretty pure. So all you had to do was compress it and get it to the uh, oil fields. And you get paid by the uh, oil fields for the CO2 uh, to enhance their uh, oil recovery. So this was uh, done before uh, there was interest in carbon capture and storage as a climate mitigation technology. Um, then uh, we started uh, seeing, uh, as I said, with Sleipner, uh, uh, carbon capture being used for um, carbon, for, for, for uh, mitigation of CO2 emissions uh, to respond to climate change. Um, I, there were four projects that I um, talk about where um, uh, you have natural gas processing. Once again, these projects had a capture in the natural gas, so the uh, gas coming out uh, of the ground was conditioned to be able to put in a pipeline, removing the excess CO2. There were four projects. Uh, I mentioned Sleipner Snowfit was also a project uh, in Norway by uh, the company Stad Oil at that time, which is now called Equinor. Um, BP had a project in the Algerian desert called Insula, and then um, Chevron had a project in Australia called Gorgon, which actually just came online recently, even though the project was initiated in the 1990s. It took um, 30 years to get it uh, up and running as a major LNG uh, producing facility. So these didn't have any government um, uh, influence. They were done. The, the amount of money needed was small compared to the overall project size. And there were various reasons, uh, like in Australia, there was sort of informal agreement between Australia and Chevron that they should do this. And it, it eased getting permits uh, for the project so they can do business there. Um, then there were what I call the megaton demos. These are demos at a million ton scale. And here the primary driver was um, a government incentive program. Uh, uh, so maybe uh, you'd get uh, a grant of uh, $300, $400 million, which would help uh, buy down the capital cost of these projects uh, so you can uh, put carbon capture and storage on there. Two power sector projects were done. One in the US uh, at Petronova. I have a picture of that coming up in a few minutes. And another one up in Canada in Saskatchewan uh, at Sask Power. Um, the Sask Power project is still operating. Uh, the Petronova project shut down, but uh, maybe started up again. It has a new buyer and, and, and may start up. We've also seen projects in the industrial sector uh, at hydrogen plants. Um, ethanol plants and, and steel plants. So in the IPCC report, we looked at um, where the big point sources that you can do this end the pipe capture are. And um, you can see the major thing was coal-fired power plants. That's changed a lot in Europe and the US. But of course, in China, India, that's still the bulk of the uh, CO2 emissions. Other power plants, basically natural gas, uh, were about 19%. And then major industries, cement, iron and steel, and refineries were, were the big targets. So when we're looking at uh, capture, uh, uh, it's not one size fits all on how you capture. There's different um, uh, product streams that contain the CO2. Um, high pressure streams uh, are the easiest to capture, even with small concentrations of CO2 in it. Um, and this comes from uh, natural gas wells like Sleipner, also from synthesis gas. So if you have an integrated gasification combined cycle plant, uh, the synthesis gas in there um, is there. And I'll talk more about that in the next module. High purity streams, which we see a lot of uh, capture today. A big project going on now in the upper Midwest to capture from ethanol plants. 
Uh, they're trying to build a pipeline to connect these plants and take the CO2 into North Dakota. It's kind of a bottleneck uh, getting the permits. Once again, I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> then, then you come to where most of the CO2, well, an oxy combustion exhaust, and I'll talk about that in the next uh, module. Then you come where most of the CO2 emissions come from. Dilute sources, uh, very dilute sources. Um, so uh, dilute sources I define as 10 to 20%. Uh, yes, coal fire plants, cement plants, uh, very dilute three to seven percent coming off of natural gas boilers and turbines. They get a lot, uh, first of all, natural gas has less CO2 uh, per BTU than um, uh, coal plants. Also, uh, especially the turbines use more dilution air, so you get a, a, um, less concentration there. And then extremely dilute, uh, less than one percent, uh, down to uh, uh, 0.04 percent is what we have in the atmosphere today. Uh, when we talk about carbon dioxide removal, we'll talk about uh, that a little. But I will say that there is commercial technology to do that, to capture CO2 off of submarines or spacecrafts needed for life support. If you didn't do that, uh, the CO2 will build up in there. Um, and um, they actually let the CO2 level build up to depending on the thing, but maybe close to 1%. So you're in a submarine or a spacecraft, you'll have elevated CO2 uh, in there. Um, basically, for the, uh, for the atmospheric uh, pressure sources, the more dilute, the harder it is to capture, the more expensive it is to capture. Um, so, when we can't, you know, question is why do we need to capture? Why do we need to separate it from the flue gas? If we're going to inject it underground, why can't we just do the whole flue gas? Well, if you're going to inject it underground, you got to pressurize it. And actually, if you want to move it anywhere, you got to pressurize it. And you can see here the energy cost of pressurizing CO2 versus here the entire flue gas of a coal fire power plant. And um, if you have a coal fire power plant, want to contrast the entire flue gas. You could be using two thirds of the energy of uh, that plant. Where if you uh, capture the CO2 first, you're using less than 10% um, of the plant. Uh, this is because, A, just the volume thing, uh, you have so much nitrogen, you have to compress. But also, CO2 is a, a compressible fluid, so it's actually easier to compress than uh, air, especially once you get it up to. Uh, it's critical pressure of about, um, well, 800 bar, which is, let's say, 800 bar is um, 1,200 PSI, somewhere, somewhere around there. At this point, you're basically pumping a liquid as opposed to compressing a gas. So the commercial technology we use today are means. Um, why do we use a means? And, uh, Basically, I call it a Goldilocks solution. Um, it means uh, will react with the CO2, but the bond is not too strong and not too weak. So you're strong enough to be able to pull the CO2 out of the exhaust, but it's uh, weak enough that it's fairly easy to release it from the, uh, uh, the solvent. Um, so how does post-combustion capture work. So you have a, a boiler. Uh, in this case, you have a coal boiler. We have air. We uh, raise steam in the boiler, and that steam is sent to a steam cycle to produce electricity. The flue gas is then sent uh, to gas cleanup to remove your criteria pollutants. And it's important to remove the criteria pollutants before you go to the CO2 capture unit because uh, the means dislike particulates. They, uh, particulates will cause it to foam, and once it foams, it's not going to work at all. Um, the sulfur dioxide and the NOx will, bo will bond with the, the amine, but that will make a strong bond, and you can't just uh, regenerate that with a temperature swing. Um, so basically, it degrades the, uh, the uh, amine in the solvent, and, and that costs money to uh, do makeup solvents. 
And so after the gas cleanup, we go into the capture plant, and that's going to require two things uh, from the plant. We need both steam and electricity uh, to make this run. And I'll go over uh, uh, the numbers on how much steam and how much electricity uh, you need. So if we look at um, a process, uh, a process flow diagram, he ba the process basically consists of two towers, an absorber tower and a stripper tower, which regenerates the CO2. We put our flue gas in the bottom of the absorber tower. We like to run this thing about 50 degrees C, so you may have to cool <coughs> the flue gas down a little. Uh, sometimes they'll have to do a little extra removal of the sulfur dioxide uh, and the NOx from uh, what you need to do for a normal plant to get it down to low enough levels. And then we put the solvent top of the column as a pack column. So you have packing in there, create a lot of surface area for the vapor liquid contacting. And as we go down the column, the, the sorbent will uh, pick up the uh, CO2. Then what we'll do is we'll heat it up. And with the stripper column, this may run about 110 degrees C. Uh, we have a cross exchanger here to recover uh, energy. Uh, the steam is put into the reboiler, and the uh, steam of the reboiler has three functions. One, in the absorber column, when the uh, CO2 reacts with the amine, is exothermic, so it gives off heat. Uh, sometimes we need to remove that heat, sometimes not. Uh, so they may have some pump arounds here to cool down the uh, solvent. You don't want it to heat up too much. But because this is at fairly low temperature, 50 degrees C, we can't recover that heat. So um, therefore, we need to provide heat for desorption. So the energy we needed to, um, that the, we released when we made the bonds here, we had to put in that energy here to release the bonds. And that comes from the reboiler. We also raise the temperature, even though we have the cross exchanger, you still need to have a temperature driving force. So you need some extra steam to give you that temperature driving force to drive the temperature swing. And then we also generate steam um, to uh, go up the column so the CO2 goes in there. The, the steam has two functions. One is a carrier gas for the CO2, but also it reduces the pressure. Um, um, that you see in the, uh, the partial pressure of the CO2 and the vapor to make it easier to come off. I'll show you some uh, equilibrium diagrams in a minute um, that will drive home that point. Then you go the, oops, where am I going? Then the solvent, as I say, is, uh, okay. Solvent is then recycled back to the, um, to the absorber, and the CO2 goes through a condenser. We knock out some of the water, and then we go to compression and dehydration where the rest of the water is knocked out, leaving us with fairly pure CO2 coming off the top of the column here. We do have a reclaimer here, so if you do have some... Um, uh, Heat stable salts from, say, uh, uh, the amine reacting with the SO2, you can reclaim it here uh, basically with a chemical uh, swing uh, coming there. So um, try to minimize the need for this, but it, but it is there so you don't have to have, so you can have a little uh, SO2 or NOx coming uh, into the uh, system. So that's how the system works. Show you here filtration to make sure. Uh, any particulates they get through uh, uh, are removed from the system. I actually visited the Trona plant, which was the first one uh, to do this. And they, they, um, they had, I remember on the wall, they had all these uh, samples of amines of all different colors. And they said until they got the filtrate, eventually got the filtration right and got the system to work. But uh, that was a big problem uh, that they had initially. But this is how, like as you do things, you learn and the process improves over time. So here's 
Here's uh, one, a plant that was built um, in the, uh, I think, early 90s. This was in uh, Oklahoma. This was uh, a plant built due to a uh, PURPA. And I, I'm pretty sure that this is the absorber. Uh, it's the fatter column. It's usually the absorber, and then this is the stripper. So you can see the size of it uh, that you have here at the plant. This was only 200 tons per day, so it's only a small strip, slip stream uh, of what they did. This is the uh, parish plant. And so, so at, at this plant, the steam for the reboiler was taken from the steam cycle. It's a little different at the, uh, at the parish plant. Um, so what you see here, this is the flue duct pipe. So instead of going up the chimney, they took a slipstream of one of the boilers uh, to go into the CO2 capture plant. Uh, this plant does 1.6 million tons a, a year of, um, of CO2. Um, the, this is the absorber here. Um, what you have here is a cogen unit fired by natural gas, and that cogen unit uh, supplies the steam needed for the uh, amine process. Instead of taking it out of the steam cycle, they, they took it here. Uh, one negative aspect of that is the CO2 emissions from the natural gas go into the atmosphere as opposed to being uh, all of it being captured if you were doing it <coughs> by integrating into the steam system. But it didn't make the the plant less uh, complex. And so let's take a look at the energy breakdown of, of the plant. And uh, basically, uh, about 60% of the energy goes to the stripper reboiler. And I'm, I am comparing um, apples to apples here. This is, even though this is steam, this is electricity, this is the electricity um, equivalent. So when you take it out of the steam cycle, you see what the electricity uh, production of the power plant goes down. So that's what that represents. Um, I get very upset in reading articles, uh, especially on carbon dioxide removal, where they, they add uh, electricity and heat together and give you a, a, a number of kilowatt hours per ton. And you just cannot, I mean, uh, kilowatt hours electric and kilowatt hours thermal are very different and, and they really can't be uh, added together. Um, it's like saying I have five apples and 10 oranges, so I have uh, 15, well, I do have 15 pieces of fruit, but you can't say I have 15 apples or 15 oranges. They're different. Uh, the compressor takes about a third, and then about 5% for the blower, uh, getting it through the uh, absorber, plus uh, other pumps in, in the process. If we take a look at the reboiler itself, I said there was three things it had to do. It had to provide heat as absorption. So that's about half of the energy. It had to provide sensible heat for the temperature swing. It's a quarter of the energy, and the stripping steam is another quarter of the energy. If we look at what this does to a power plant, um, if you have a, a, um, a supercritical power plant without capture and your uh, overall efficiency is 38.5, uh, if we put carbon capture and storage on it, it may reduce the overall efficiency down to about 29.3, about a 25% reduction uh, in, uh, in output. So a pretty big parasitic load. Um, once again, this is from the uh, reboiler steam, the electricity for the compressor, and then the uh, blower and other uh, power needs, the pumps in the plant. If we look, um, <clears throat> once again, another way to look at this is separation energy. We don't have capture. Um, for every kilogram of CO2 going up the smokestack, uh, we produce a kilowatt hour or 1.2 kilowatt hours uh, coming out of the uh, power plant. If we look at for minimum work, you can calculate the exact minimum work. So if I have a, uh, a stream that's 10% CO2 and 90% uh, 
other gases, and I want to pull out 90% of the CO2, I can calculate exactly what that uh, theoretical minimum work is, and that's about uh, 0.1 in this kilogram per kilogram of CO2 units. And when we look at real power plants with 90% capture, that number is about 0.3. And so it's maybe three times above uh, minimum work, which is um, uh, it's fairly typical for these type of processes. Uh, we're, I think today we're down a little better, um, maybe uh, instead of uh, three times as much, or maybe down to closer to two and a half with some of the newer processes. And probably you're not going to do much better. Getting it to twice the theoretical is probably as close as you're going to get. Because to get to the theoretical uh, with minimum work, the corollary uh, is if you operate a minimum work, you need infinite capital cost. Because you can have no irreversibility. So you have to have heat exchangers of infinite size and the like. So you got to back off from theoretical uh, to get your capital cost uh, to, a, to a decent size. And this is sort of what um, you sort of see in a uh, power plant. So if we're going to compare uh, power plant exhaust gas characteristics, um, if, we, if we look here, uh, I have in red means it's a disadvantage. So uh, Coal, maybe about 12%. Uh, and natural gas, uh, depending if you're a boiler or a uh, turbine, uh, you're much lower. Uh, this means you need larger absorbers uh, for gas, uh, bigger diameters. Um, you don't really have particulates or sulfur to worry about in the natural gas, um, but you do need to worry about it in a uh, coal plant. You have to worry about NOx in both. And you have more excess air <coughs> in a gas plant. And as I said, excess air um, it can be a problem for a means. And that's. Um, I have a question on the NOx. Sure. Uh, they both say yes, but you know, the gas plant is probably going to have two orders of magnitude less NOx than the coal plant. Yeah, I mean, the NOx is going to be less. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, so it's what it is. What you worry about is how to do it. So if you, if you have less NOx, say you're using a low NOx technology, um, so you have some NOx. That's why you, know, you may have a reclaimer in there. Uh, once again, uh, whether that's low, I can't say offhand whether that's low enough. We, they haven't really done this on natural gas plants yet. Uh, on a coal plant, it means you're going to probably have to put in um, uh, selective catalytic reduction. Uh, before you go into in, in, into the power plant, so you know I don't know if that level. I don't know at this point, you know, what the trade-offs, whether you need extra NOx cleanup or not, or you can just handle it, say, with a reclaimer or, or live with a little solvent degradation. There's just not enough information out there yet. So um, th those are some design questions, but you do have to keep that in mind. Um, and then finally, as I say, excess air. So I think the solvents are pretty good with the um, additives they put in to, to deal with the uh, excess air these days. So I'm going to talk a little about uh, going to a little of the details of uh, capture. And you know, basically, we have to worry about both equilibrium, which is set by thermodynamics, kinetics which is um, uh, uh, you know, uh, mass transfer and, and the rates. And um, so well, I think people here understand that. Let's take a look at the next slide. So chemical scrubbing is generally liquid phase mass transfer limited. So the kinetics, here's the liquid phase. We have a boundary. So in the vapor, you have uh, a total pressure of the gas and a CO2 concentration, you multiply them together, that's your partial pressure. Uh, you have equilibrium at the interface with the liquid. Uh, as I say, the 
um, the uh, <clears throat> generally is mass is liquid phase limited. Uh, if you start going to the air capture systems, you may start getting uh, va some vapor phase limitations in there. But uh, for the for power plants, it's uh, all in the liquid, and the concentration here is set by Henry's law. Um, uh, so we will know the concentration at the boundary. And then the, the mass transfer is equal to a diffusion coefficient. And basically, it's just uh, the CO2 water diffusion coefficient. It doesn't really uh, depend on the solvent that much. The uh, interfacial area and then the concentration gradient, which really this number x. So the faster your reaction kinetics are, in the bulk, the, uh, the smaller x will be and the, the faster your, uh, the more steep will be your gradient and the faster will be your mass transfer. So that's why if, you, if um, that's why I say a means creates fast enough mass transfer, uh, you can go to a stronger um, base like uh, carbonates and decrease the x, but then you're gonna pay for it in trying to regenerate the, the solvent. So this is uh, uh, the basics uh, of the mass transfer. And so if we want to ma maximize the flux, well, you're really, you're given a feed stream. So you like to have high pressure. You like to have high concentrations. Um, the interfacial area you control by your, your packing choice. It is a trade-off. Um, You'd like to have a high interfacial area with low pressure drops. Uh, the higher the pressure drop, uh, of course, the more your energy use is. Um, the other is how do we decrease X, and that's by uh, solvent costs. And as I just said here, uh, you really desire a, a, a smaller boundary layer, but it's a trade-off with the regeneration costs. Generally, um, the, the, the smaller the boundary layer, means you have uh, more, um, more attraction between your solvent and the CO2, which will increase your regeneration cost. Um, there's, uh, generally, I, I look at three types of solvents uh, for physical absorption, and this is really for systems at pressure. Um, you can use things like a physical sorbent, rectosol or selexol, and you actually can use like a secondary amine, and, and you can re you regenerate these by pressure swing, or maybe if you're doing a secondary amine, a little temperature pressure swing. Um, but physical absorption is fairly simple. It's, um, it's like a, a bottle of soda pop. Uh, the CO2 is in that soda pop under pressure. When you take the cap off, you're doing a pressure swing, and eventually all the CO2 will come out and you end up with a flat soda. Um, so this is uh, what we uh, uh, do here. Physical absorption is much cheaper than chemical absorption, um, but you need to have the right feed stream to do that. And then as I just said, uh, there's a trade-off between say weak bases like uh, amines or ammonia where you can do a temperature swing versus something like hydroxides where you do a chemical swing. Uh, people aren't really using hydroxides for point source capture, but we'll come back to this when we look at carbon dioxide removal and direct air capture, where they're using both weak bases and strong bases and sort of the, um, you say the verdict's still out um, when you're capturing from the air, which is better to do. The, when you uh, design your absorber, um, so you're given a certain, you have a certain gas flow and pressure coming in. So this is your flue gas. Um, this CO2 rich solvent to the stripper, that will be what's calculated based on these other parameters. Uh, your diameter is pretty much set by your gas flow rate. Um, and then, so you, re you really have, and once again, the, how much you take out of it is, uh, going to be calculated based on, you basically have three parameters you can play with. The height of the column, the liquid flow rate, which uh, gives you a, a liquid to gas flow rate ratio, and the lean loading, how much, 
how much CO2 is on your solvent coming in. So you never take off all the CO2 of your solvent when you regenerate. Uh, so how, how much do you take off? Those are your three choices in, in designing these columns. The trade-offs here, well, we, we'd like to have high L over G because this will capture more of the CO2. Um, it uh, will increase your uh, um, driving force. Uh, basically, uh, you know, it will keep the CO2 out of, you know, you have less CO2 building up in your uh, solvent, but uh, the higher liquid rate will yield you a higher energy cost. Uh, the height of the column, uh, once again, will increase the amount of uh, CO2 you recover. Um, it, uh, it basically increases, um, well, I guess this uh, time that you're in the column, uh, and, but this will result in higher capital cost. And lead loading, you'd like to keep low, uh, so you can, once again, have bigger driving forces um, between the... Uh, uh, solvent and the uh, gas, but once again, this is higher energy cost. And I'm going to sort of go into the thermodynamics a little. This is from a, a thesis a student did uh, that modeled uh, the column. And what we see here are two curves. This is uh, basically um, the thermodynamic equilibrium curve of, of a mean at the red is 60 degrees centigrade. So Think of that as your absorber, and the uh, green is the stripper. And you can see what happens when you raise the temperature. You change the equilibrium. Um, so at a given loading, uh, the partial pressure above it uh, becomes bigger. And so at a bigger partial pressure, so, so here, if you're at, at equilibrium, we have a part, well, let's do it. Well, well <coughs> here would be, in uh, one um, um, millimeter of mercury, uh, when you raise the pressure, temperature, you, you raise the partial pressure by about a factor of um, 80. So then the CO2 will wanna uh, try to, to leave the um, sorbent. In terms of loading, so this say a 10% CO2 in the flue gas, um, <laughs> Uh, the maximum loading, rich loading you can get. So um, if you have 10% um, in the flue gas and, and that goes into equilibrium with the uh, solvent, it gives you a loading of about 0.5. Uh, on the other end, if you're taking out 90%, so now you have a 1 one hundredth of an atmosphere loading, then the maximum uh, loading would be about 0.4. Of course, you, wanna, you can go lower, and actually want to go lower um, to, to drive it off. But uh, there are some issues. You can't go so, so far loading. So you see here, this is the simulations that were done pretty much for all different L over Gs. And remember, um, the bigger the L over G, the more recovery you get um, you know, for a given height. Um, but here, your rich loading um, uh, is about that 0 0.5 that we saw from the thermodynamics. Uh, and your lean loading uh, can go down. And, but there's a limit to how far down you can go. And you can see what happens to the reboiler duty. It's, uh, it's pretty flat. Uh, and you sort of minimize the reboiler duty at an L over G here, which is a loading of about 0.15. If you try to go lower, all of a sudden, your reboiler duty is starting to shoot up. So what's happening here um, is that uh, in order to get more CO2 off in the uh, stripper, um, you need to sort of lower the pressure in there, and you lower the pressure uh, in the vapor, and you lower the pressure in the vapor by creating more steam. But that steam costs energy, and you can see it's very nonlinear. And so that's why your lean loadings usually are uh, uh, 0.1, you know, 0.15, maybe a little lower uh, when you see these things in real operation. So um, that's sort of how you, you think about designing these 
uh, uh, absorber stripper systems. And if we wanted to talk about capture percent, and capture percent starting to become a, a fairly uh, important issue um, uh, now because uh, people say, oh, well, capturing, a lot of the studies look at a nominal capture at 90%. Why have they looked at 90%? Well, because above 90%, your marginal cost of capture starts going up. But people are saying, well, if we're going to hit net zero, you really can't afford to do, have any CO2 go up. In these big energy economic models, if you don't have 100% capture, if you have 90% capture, they, these models run by putting a carbon price on. And, and in the future, the carbon price gets so big that uh, even if you have 5% uh, of coming off of a, uh, of a column, it, it, it penalizes you with a very high carbon price. And so those models don't accept it. In reality, I don't think that really happens. Um, but it, it has put pressure saying, what can we really get the percentage up to? Um, and one other interesting point is that you don't have to do 100% capture to have a net zero power plant. And why is that? Because there's CO2 coming in with your combustion air. So you're allowed to put that CO2 back out and still have a net zero power plant. So there was a recent paper done on this. Um, and uh, we, they looked at uh, high capture percentages. And you can see here the capture rate. You can see the uh, capture cost, you know, above 90%. It is increasing slightly, but it's, it's not that much. So the marginal cost isn't going up that much until you start getting up uh, 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 to 99% and stuff, and then it starts sh really shooting up. Similar on natural gas uh, uh, flues, except that starts shooting up uh, uh, a little earlier uh, going there. So this is saying... It's probably pretty economical going to 95% or even 98% um, on these plants um, if need be. Um, so that's a means. Uh, I'm going to go on to talk about some other post-combustion capture technologies. Um, I'll stop you. Any, any questions before I go on? OK. Well, yeah, let me let me come up in here a little better. So, yeah, go ahead again. Start again. Oh, on, on some of the numbers I've shown. Yeah. Yeah, that was based pretty much on ninety percent capture. Yeah, I mean most of the studies use ninety percent capture. Um, because we thought that was pretty good back 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but uh, as I say, um, viewpoints have changed. So let's look at some other things. I just put this in here to give you some references. This is a workshop we did um, how many years ago? Uh, about 12 years ago. And we put out a proceedings looking at different other different post-combustion and capture technologies. Um, so. What are people looking at? One thing is new and improved solvents. There's different types of amines you can use. Uh, uh, there's other solvents, ammonia. Ammonia was a solvent that had a lot of interest uh, um, about 10 years ago and, and quite a few studies on it. And just want to show you, use that as an example of um, comparing solvents. So I mean, when you're comparing solvents, uh, there's different things you want to look at. What's the regeneration energy? Um, what's the reactivity? And what are the characteristics? How's the cost? How's it? How's it? Um, does it, how does it degrade? How fast uh, is it volatile? Because coming off the top of the absorber, you don't want a lot of uh, your solvent coming up. In fact, you won't be able to uh, emit your solvent coming up in most cases. Uh, and um, you know what's the capacity? So uh, let's take a look um, at ammonia versus amines. 
And one reason people really liked ammonia was it had lower regeneration energy than amines. Um, so people thought, okay, we're gonna save energy. But the problem was the reactivity of ammonia was very poor. And it, it, I think it was a factor of five times slower. So all of a sudden now your capital cost and your absorber is gonna go through the roof. Um, let me come down here. The other problem with ammonia, when I'm putting an X here, it means it means they have the advantage. Ammonia was very volatile, um, which means in order to control the volatility, they actually had to chill the process to a, to a colder temperature. So they called it the chilled ammonia process. Yet when they chilled it, that also hurt the reactivity. Um, so, you know, so people, well, the cost, when I'm talking the cost, the cost of ammonia versus amine, just as the solvent itself was cheaper. Uh, ammonia uh, um, could put up with impurities a lot better. It had a higher capacity per, per uh, unit solvent. Uh, but because the reactivity was slow and the volatility was high, it just never got anywhere. And uh, pretty much no one's looking at ammonia today. Um, but as I said, there were, uh, you know, quite a few uh, um, efforts to, to look at that as an alternative solvents. So I think these improved solvents, I think we're still improving them. Uh, there's a, a, a paper I showed with the uh, high, um, high rate of capture came out of uh, University of Texas with uh, EPRI as a co-author. And um, they, they used a solvent called, uh, an amine called piperzine. And so that's sort of one of the newer ones. And it does make modest improvements. Um, but I think, you know, large improvements like cutting in half the cost, you're just not going to see from uh, solvent improvements. Um, what you do is you have a whole list here of ideas that people have been looking on, working on in terms of uh, uh, different post-combustion captures. Uh, a big thing, these MOFs, metal organic frameworks have been put big. Uh, I mean, basically you can, um, they're, they're sort of a substrate that you can um, uh, dope with different chemicals. That's uh, got a lot of play, but it hasn't really moved forward much. You still see some, uh, just, just last week I saw somebody pushing MOFs for uh, direct air capture. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of times they're doping these meta-organic frameworks with uh, amines. And the problems is the MOFs themselves are pretty expensive. And their characteristic, operating characteristics are doped with amine doesn't change that much from uh, the other amine column. A lot of uh, electrochemical uh, work has been tried and is still ongoing. I'm gonna talk about uh, one process, cryogenics, which um, I found interesting. It's developed by a professor at um, uh, Brigham Young University, uh, Larry Baxter. And uh, I think it was pretty, in pretty ingenious. The, the problem with cryogenic um, separation of CO2. Now, if you want oxygen and nitrogen, you know, oxygen from the air, they always use cryogenic. That's the cheapest uh, scalable process there is. The problem with trying to do that, and that's nitrogen-oxygen separation, the flue gas separation of nitrogen and CO2, the problem when you do that is CO2 freezes. And as we know, that's not uh, always easy to handle in a process. And see up on the screen here, uh, basically solid CO2. So uh, this company, SES Innovation, which was then uh, uh, bought out by Chart, um, had a process to do this uh, where they actually do freeze the CO2, uh, but they remove it by using a solvent in there. In this, so they have this separator. So they, so they basically take the flue gas and, and cool it down. And, and the way you cool it down, <clears throat> well, you can either cool it down with external refrigeration or with, um, by uh, compression and expansion. Um, so you cool it down and you can separate it uh, here with the use of a solvent and then um, you, you bring it back up and you can pressurize and you 
uh, gasify it, and you can gasify it under pressure to save your compression cost, and then your other gases are, are uh, emitted out. So this process, here are some claims from the process. They claim lower energy and uh, cost, and lower energy and cost, uh, uh, the, but, you know, so these are some of the typical uh, things, but it does have high capture rates. It handles impurities better, and in some ways they can, they have the process so they can actually take out these impurities during the freezing. Uh, it has some costs, but they, they can do it uh, in there. Um, and it's, it's, it's more plug and play. They don't need steam, it's all electric, electrically driven, which I think is important. Um, uh, to do, but it you know hasn't been demonstrated at scale. They're uh, uh, supposed to do a 30 ton per day pilot at a uh, cement plant out in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, so the uh, project started on uh, 2022, and I'm not exactly sure where they are um, to do it. So this there's a picture of uh, what the plant uh, would look like. So this is sort of an alternative process that's been out there. It's, it's sort of more advanced than some of the uh, others, and they actually have uh, some pilot-level uh, demonstrations. So I, you know, whether it beats the means or not, I don't know. There's, there's always been a question in the um, carbon capture community. Uh, there's a professor at the University of Texas, Gary Rochelle, who he's the one that did the piperzine, um, and he... He, you know, he claims you can try these other things, but you're going to come back to chemical scrubbing. And the reason he gives is um, the SO2 um, uh, scrubbing. And when the SO2 scrubbing first came out, Congress actually mandated that they try alternative processes. So DOE funded, um, I think, at least three different alternative approaches uh, to remove SO2. And in the end, they came back to the uh, chemical scrubbing. And he, he thinks you'll find the same thing uh, going on here. I'm not totally convinced, but he makes a pretty good argument. And as of today, uh, no one's really beat the chemical scrubbing uh, process. Yeah. There was this uh, Arc&E company that was um, basically a rocket. It was using a cryogenic idea where they were expanding it to Which company was doing that? I can't remember, but they got all the e Okay, I'm not so familiar with that. I, I do know, I do know some cryogenic things in the. I mean, Exxon, uh, back uh, back in the 1990s, uh, invented this um, distillation column. They had what they called a controlled freezing tray. Um, they were actually trying to do that uh, to separate out. Uh, there was a big field in Indonesia, Natuna, which was a giant gas field. Unfortunately, 75% was CO2, but it was so big, there was still a lot of methane in there. And they were trying to say, well, can we use that to, to do this? And, um, you know, the, the process worked, but it never, they never got it working. They never implemented it at scale. Um, the other one I know is Alstom Power had a big process on uh, cryogenics, but I, I don't know the details of their process. So I'm sure there were, were others, but I, I'm not familiar with them. Um, so we talked mainly about power, but um, recent trends are that there's interest in carbon capture beyond power. And in fact, there's been a de-emphasis on power in the US and in Europe, and that's because uh, of a couple things. One, uh, originally in the U.S., this was a carbon capture came out of the coal program, and um, with the natural gas coming in and, and coal being uh, de-emphasized, um, uh, it became less interesting. Also, with the um, renewables coming in, uh, once again, they saw less of a need in the power sector, and with the renewables driving down capacity factors and the cheap natural gas driving down wholesale prices, it became more expensive to put CCS on power plants 
than it was the economics were, say, 15 years ago. So there's interest beyond the power, power sector, and then it's the industrial sector, hydrogen, and I'll come back and how that links to the power sector, and negative emissions. So negative emissions we'll talk about uh, tomorrow, but um, uh, we'll, we'll look at the other two here, and then we'll go on to break. So industries, about 20% of uh, global CO2 emissions um, is a significant uh, percentage uh, uh, of the CO2 emissions comes from the process. So the first uh, thing we see up here, the calcium carbonate, uh, going to calcium oxide and CO2, that's the cement process, the calcining of limestone. And about 60% of the CO2 in, in, a, in, a, in a cement process comes from this equation and not from the energy, uh, the burning of energy. Uh, in iron ore, uh, you're reducing iron ore. And once again, uh, you see here, um, reducing it uh, with carbon, uh, a lot of times with coke that makes coking gas, uh, with the CO, and that will reduce the iron and uh, produce CO2. So even if you can go totally to non-carbon energy sources, you still have to process CO2. So uh, there seems to be a fit there uh, for CO2. Um, and um, there's really limited options you know, people talk about, I say, carbon-free fuels, but once again, that, that only gets you so far. So you really need to go to alternative processes. People are looking at uh, reduction of um, iron ore with hydrogen, but that's extremely expensive. Another a colleague of mine at MIT is looking at uh, uh, electrolytic reduction of iron ore, similar to what they do with aluminum, uh, but that's at a very early stage. Um, Let's take a look at hydrogen, because uh, I think uh, a, a lot of focus has been on hydrogen. In fact, as I said, the Department of Energy are creating these hydrogen hubs, and at least one of them is going to be on what's called blue hydrogen, which is basically making um, hydrogen from natural gas with CCS. So we'll take a look at, at the processes for doing that. It's been demonstrated uh, at, at least two plants here in North America, one up in the uh, Canada, uh, the Quest project uh, near Edmonton, and one down in Texas at uh, Air Products. Uh, there's been announcements. Uh, Air Products has announced a major blue hydrogen facility in Louisiana, um, a, a pretty big plant. Uh, there's also people talk from uh, hydrogen from um, pyrolysis. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Um, uh, by methane pyrolysis, um, that's, uh, there's actually a professor at MIT that's uh, working on this, and the real key there is uh, when you do methane pyrolysis, you're making hydrogen and carbon, you know, that carbon is basically soot. A lot of processes, you don't want to make soot, they come up the process, it's, it's hard to do it. So, so the project at MIT what he's doing is he's actually using a liquid metal bath of tin, a very high temperature, uh, to try to control the, um, the uh, methane formation. I'm sorry, the uh, carbon formation from the pyrolysis. Uh, if we look at steam methane reforming, uh, this is a schematic. And there's really three places you can capture the CO2 from. So you have the, the methane reforming coming in. Then you do the water gas shift to basically have uh, your carbon in the form of CO2. Uh, obviously not all of it, but most of it. Uh, and so you can capture it. This is fairly high pressure. You can capture about 60% of the total CO2 in the process. And the concentration seal there is 15 to 16%. But the key is it's high pressure. And that lets you uh, have fairly inexpensive, and in fact, this is where they capture it uh, from both those demonstrations I talked about, the air products and the shell project. Uh, you have some CO2 in the tail gas, and you could capture here, but uh, it doesn't make much sense. This is at low pressure, and you're only going to capture about 55% of the total CO2. It is at a little higher um, concentration, but here the pressure is, is the main thing. If you want to capture at low pressure, um, you can capture over 90% uh, 
from the flue gas. So it's just like a flue gas of a power plant. You have about 19% CO2 here in the, um, in the flue gas. Um, so this sort of just repeats what I, what I said. Um, air products, uh, I mean, Quest uses a means. Um, it's a secondary amine uh, that does a, a pressure swing uh, along with low temperature swing. So it's, it's much less expensive than what we see at a flue gas of a power plant because, once again, they're capturing from the syngas. And air products it actually uses a, a vacuum swing adsorption system. This is a picture of the air products plant. And here's the vacuum swing absorbers over here doing the CO2 capture. Once again, there's about a million tons a year that it's uh, capturing. Uh, when we're going forward and people are looking at these blue hydrogen plants where they're going to do it at scale, they look like they're moving to autothermal reforming. Um, and this can capture about 95%. And the way that this works is uh, you have um, an air separation unit and an autothermal reformer. So if I go back here, you see there's some extra fuel being fed here that uh, gives the energy for the steam reforming. Here what we have is we, we don't have that, um, we don't have that fuel, but we actually uh, use the methane coming in and we uh, basically combust some of that or, uh, or react some of that to get our energy needed. Of course, we need to have oxygen, so we need to use some uh, carbon-free electricity if we want to keep this low carbon uh, to produce oxygen because we don't want the extra CO2 coming in there. Um, or we don't want the nitrogen coming in there, I should say, to dilute it. Water gas shift. And then we can do our CO2 capture and basically capture about 95% of the CO2 from the process. There'll still be a little CO2 coming off in, in the tail gas from the uh, PSA. Um, I'll say a couple words about hydrogen and then uh, take any final questions and we'll, and we'll go to break. But um, hydrogen production is only one part of the equation. You still have to worry about hydrogen transport, hydrogen storage, and what end uses we're going to have for the hydrogen. So uh, we don't have a lot of end uses beyond what we have today in the, in the chemical industry. We're basic, the hydrogen is made and used at the same time. A lot of it's used in refineries for up upgrading. So um, will there be other new uses for hydrogen? One, one thing we're looking at is maybe hydrogen in the power sector to replace um, natural gas uh, for your uh, turbines. As I said, that's one option people can use uh, if the EPA new guidelines come in into effect. So we'll see if that happens. But there's other issues in hydrogen. Uh, safety issues. Um, uh, I think it be managed pretty well in industrial commercial sectors. I don't see it in the in the uh, out to the general public. Uh, hydrogen's uh, uh, has high flammability limits. It has propensity to leak. Uh, if it does catch on fire, the flame's invisible. Uh, so it's not it's not something that's. Uh, <laughs> and, and if these things can happen, they will happen. Uh, it also has a, a global warming uh, potential. And I forget the number, maybe somewhere of 5 or 10, if I remember right. And uh, the IPC calls this a short-lived chemical force or a precursor gas. It works through atmospheric chemistry. It basically uh, reacts with the OH um, radical in the atmosphere and, and reduces that. The OH radical is something that cleans up the atmosphere. It's one thing that... Um, reduces methane concentration in the atmosphere, for instance. So there's a lot of hype about hydrogen, and there's been a lot of hype about hydrogen in the past, um, and uh, including it started with a nuclear industry when electricity is going to be too cheap to meter. What are we can do with all this extra energy? We'll make hydrogen, and we can use it for fuel. Uh, George Bush uh, in the 2000s had a big push for hydrogen vehicles. Uh, there has been a success story of hydrogen, and that's forklifts. So all these uh, warehouses out there, Amazon, uh, for instance, 
They use forklifts. You don't want to use a fossil fuel on a forklift and create indoor air pollution. You could electrify the forklifts, but the batteries take up too much space, take too long to charge, or hydrogen is very easy to, to, to install. When it burns, it just gives you water. And so um, there's, um, I don't know, tens of thousands of forklifts in these uh, warehouses these days. And so that's the success story of hydrogen. You know, questions are, will there be more? So I'm a little over on our break time, but why don't we, uh, it's 422, why don't we come back? Well, any questions before we break? Yes. I've got a few questions for you. Uh, all of this talk about controlling the carbon and whatnot. Uh, what is the actual breakover for the global carbon cycle? Uh, so what do we need to get our global carbon output reduced Say it again. Um, what do we need to get our global carbon output reduced to? That's the uh, CO2 means as well as uh, production, as you were saying, with uh, pulling out carbon from methane. What do we need to reduce our carbon output as a species? You mean to get to net zero? or uh, Net zero would be bad. We need to reduce it to some level. Though. Yeah, well... That's sort of an economic question, but I mean, people want to hit net zero. So the question is, how do you get there and how much uh, fossil fuel use with carbon emissions can we have and offset with um, uh, carbon dioxide removal technologies? So, you know, you know obviously, um, it's really how much is the policy going to drive it down to? So, uh, I mean, people think, you know, there's lots of different opinions, and it's not all technical. So, I believe you may have misunderstood my question. Uh, I'm saying policies aside, what do we need to get down to as far as our CO2 emissions? If we could say, you know, China do whatever uh, that they need to do, what do we need to reduce our CO2 emissions? So, you know, once again, it depends what's driving that. If you want to hit 1.5 degrees C or you want to hit 2 degrees C uh, stabilization, then those carbon budgets I showed in the previous lecture, that's how much we can emit, but that's cumulative. But eventually, eventually, we need to get to either zero emissions or whatever emissions we do do, we need to offset with carbon dioxide removal technologies. And so what, I mean, numbers that you hear, and once again, it's, it's with this idea that we're, we've got to stabilize uh, con greenhouse gas concentrations. Basically, 90 to 95% of our current CO2 or carbon emissions will probably have to be eliminated. Uh, and then follow-up question on that. How much does an individual exhale in CO2 per year? I don't know, but that is, that is what should I say, already in the natural carbon cycle. Yes, sir. We were just talking about back in the 1750s, and the population has grown exponentially since the 1750s. Yeah, but so... So, so remember the carbon dioxide where um, the carbon dioxide we're exhaling is biogenic. Yes. So, um, so there's a difference between fossil carbon and biogenic carbon. Right. And actually, that's a debate going on how you, one uses biomass and as carbon emissions from biomass um, count in that budget, or is it separate? So. Um, the, you know, so we eat plants or we eat meat, we digest it, we, we uh, you know, we, we create carbon, we exhale. But that came, originally that came out of the atmosphere and just putting it back in. So as I said, you know, there's that giant carbon cycle going on. So that's not forcing it. So, you know, that's not really looked at in this equation. It's, it, and so it's bioavailable carbon is what we exhale. 
is what? Bioavailable. So, like uh, in one of the previous classes, uh, there was talk of the emissions from CO2 is not really, or soot, it's not really bioavailable for plants and trees. And I, I'm sorry, I missed the, it's, say that again. Bioavailable carbon. Yeah. So, uh, essentially, you're saying what we exhale is bioavailable carbon, it can go back into cycle, but some of this other carbon that we are uh, putting into the system is not available for plants to reuptake. Well, yeah, I mean, well, it is available, and plants, you know, I showed the carbon cycle before, so some of it is, can go back into plants, um, the, but the, um, the problem is, is the fossil fuel were taken out of the ground you know, we were in balance, and now that fossil fuel we're taking out of the ground has put it out of balance. And if the carbon wasn't going to plants in the ocean, then the amount, you know, then the amount we're putting in the atmosphere would even uh, hurting us more. So, so plants, you know, so these carbon sinks are helpful. And, and, and tomorrow I'll go more into that um, on, on how they can maybe help us. But those are the type of carbon removals that could allow us to continue um, uh, the, the use of uh, fossil, you know, the use of fossil fuels. There's a debate on, you know, as I say, I think the consensus is we still need to reduce by at least 90%. Some people say, oh, we can have so much removals, we may only need to re um, decrease 70%. I think that's probably not practical, but, okay? Okay. All right. All right. Why don't, uh, it's 4.30. Why don't we take a break? We'll come back uh, at a quarter to five, and I'll see how much of the next section I can get through. And what I don't get through, we'll carry over to the morning.